by why we're here. Um, and so society and technology have, have undergone significant change since the industrial age, and yet our systems of governance seem to be stuck in an era, that era long past. And sadly, they're sadly out of touch with how times have changed and even sadder have ossified into systems of oligarchic power. And things don't need to be that way. New technology has opened up opportunities for large scale participation in governance and we need to grab those opportunities and we need to experiment. And this is what Taiwan has been doing, experimenting in collaboratively governing uh, citizens and, and government officials together, working to solve tough problems, uh, building trust, building a better future. And we're incredibly lucky to have uh, a team of people from Taiwan. They've joined us for a two-day workshop. They just finished, and now they're here to chat with us about uh, their work, their ethos, uh, what's, what's been going on in Taiwan, and welcome all of your questions. I'm just going to introduce everyone who is here. We have Audrey Tang, who is Taiwan's digital minister, and she co-founded the Public Digital Innovation and Service Unit, PIDIS, within Taiwan's central government. We have Xu Yang Lin, who is an intera interaction designer and co-founder of PIDIS. We have Zach Huang, who's also a co-founder of the, of the PIDIS unit. Avro Xiao, where's Avro's? <laughs> She's a senior legal consultant at PIDES and a legal researcher at the Science and Technology Law Institute of the Institute of Information Industry. We have Fang Rei Chang. She's a service designer and consultant at PIDES. Back there. Um, Tiffany Chang, participation officer from the National Development Council of Taiwan. Patricia Huang. Hello, everyone. <laughs> participation officer from the Agriculture Council. And we also have Chi Hao Yu, who's an activist and an artist who works for the new media group Watch Out, and he's a member of the civic tech community Gov Zero. He very much keeps the government on their toes. Um, so without occupying more of your time, I will hand, hand it over to Audrey. So, um, yeah, very happy to be here, and after a... Test. Okay, well. <laughs> right, so, um, yeah, um, after a two-day uh, workshop, uh, I think that this is the first time that, although we have held like hundreds, literally hundreds of uh, curriculum for participation officer training and open government training in Taiwan, this is our first time doing it in all English, and uh, we're very happy that during the past couple of days, there's a lot of feedback of the methodologies that we're, we're doing. Uh, but tonight's reception is is considerably lighter weight. Uh, you will not <laughs> be asked to fill in those idea development uh, post-it notes, but, uh, although you're uh, feel free to, to look uh, at it uh, after the talk. Uh, but uh, there, there is one crowdsourcing element, though. So if you have a laptop or a phone that can connect to the entire webs, the internet, uh, please go to slido.com. There's a website there. Uh, and enter today's date preceded by two zeros. So that's zero, zero. Six one two, uh, and once you uh, go to slido.com and enter zero zero six one two and press join, uh, you'll be dropped into this anonymous or pseudonymous. Uh, or even real name if you prefer uh, chat room uh, where you can ask um, the Taiwan delegate any questions. Uh, and so um, the time structure will be like I'll start with this roughly 15 minutes talk about um, this is like a hyper condensed version of the two day workshop of the political context uh, that leads us to, to here. Uh, but at any time, feel free to just raise your hand or don't raise your hand and interrupt me uh, and engage your, a conversation right here. Or um, if you prefer not to be that vocal, you can just enter your questions on Slido uh, and even like each other's questions so that the question that's liked by the most number of people at the end of this talk will um, 
dedicate more time uh, to answer those questions, and we um, will we promise to answer any and all questions um, uh, that's posted on Slido, whether pseudonymously or anonymously. So that's the uh, time structure. If you um, don't know how to um, link to Slido, or, or if you have some questions about how to use the system, please feel free to ask people around you. So without further ado, let's begin. Right, so um, unlike many people today working on democracy, I'm an optimist uh, through and through. Uh, and <laughs> this strange condition <laughs> began when I was 15 years old. That was 1996. I discovered that the future of human knowledge is on this new thing called the World Web and that my textbooks were all out of date. So I told my teachers that I want to quit school and start my education on the World Web. And surprisingly, the teachers all agree with it. So I dropped out of junior high. Uh, a year later, uh, I founded a startup working on web technologies. And I discovered this fabulous internet society uh, that runs with this crazy idea. It's a open, multi-stakeholder political system that powers the internet um, till this day. And so today, as Taiwan's first digital minister, I'm putting into practice the idea that I learned when I was 15 years old. That's rough consensus and civic participation and radical transparency. And surprisingly, it's working and it's transforming our society. Now, two years ago, our president, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, uh, said an inspiring statement in her inauguration speech. She said, before, in Taiwan, democracy was a clash between two opposing values. But from now on, democracy must become a conversation between many different values. Indeed, in conventional thinking, um, there's like the government as a rope between various different interest groups. Uh, it may be about, you know, um, business profits and environmental protection. It may be between the left and the right. It may be between the orange Taiwan and the blue and the green. Uh, there are many op opposite forces that often contract each other and forcing the government to make trade-offs. Um, but I think in 21st century, um, internet technologies allow us to not just speak to millions of people, but actually listen to millions of people and have millions of people listen to one another. And so we're trying a different set of questions that the government asks instead of asking what is fair or what is um, the minimum compromise, we ask instead, what are our common values despite our different positions? And we ask, given the common values, even that people have different positions, can we find solutions that works for everyone? And so this is a spirit of co-creation, and this is where the government becomes a space, which is why PETIS called ourselves the public digital innovation space. Uh, it becomes a space rather than um, a arbiter uh, of things. It's a space for co-creation. Indeed, in the past couple of years, Taiwan has been consistently ranked the top country internationally on open data, on internet participation rates, on women's digital access, digital inclusivity, and so on. And all this was because we adopted uh, as our national agenda in 2014, open data and crowdsource as the national direction. And it was catalyzed and epitomized by an Occupy movement that many people from Taiwan here participated back in March 2014. Uh, uh, that, that was a live demo of mass participation, and we occupied the parliament for 22 days. At the time, the MPs in Taiwan were refusing to deliberate one particular trade service agreement with Beijing, and so the, since the MPs you know, were on strike of sorts, the occupiers just got into the parliament and did uh, their work for them and, and stayed there for 22 days. And so for 22 days, we demonstrated how uh, we can deliberate such a trade service agreement with the whole society. It's empowered by around 20 NGOs participating, the Greens, the Labors, and so on. They were all around the Occupy Parliamentary site and each taking care of one particular aspect of the trade service agreement. And uh, one of the features of that Occupy as compared to many other Occupies is that it is a converging uh, Occupy. Every day we start with a recap of the previous day's consensus of the remaining items and then we we use um, internet and communication technologies and logistics uh, to make sure that each day that we move inch toward a consensus a little bit more until the 22nd day where it is a very firm set of six consensus items that was agreed by the head of the parliament so the Occupy was a victory. 
And so um, this whole deliberation, uh, which you can see more about this movement in GovZero.Asia, uh, and now the New York chapter, GovZero.Network, uh, whenever we take this talk to New Zealand, there's GovZero.NZ, to Italy, there's GovZero.IT. Um, and so it is, um, the, the innovation is mostly in this domain name. Um, this domain name is basically <laughs> that uh, all the government websites in Taiwan uh, ends in gov.tw, and so um, some hackers, um, back in 2012, uh, registered this domain name called g0v.tw that basically says, um, don't ask why nobody is providing this public service. Uh, admit first that you're that nobody and you can set up a corresponding Gov0 website for each and every government service that the citizen feel the government should provide but does not provide. And it's very easy to discover. You can just take any government website, change O to a zero, and get to the shadow government. And so... <laughs> That's that's the that's the initial idea, and the GovZero movement supported the logistics and the ICT systems of the Sunflower uh, Occupy. The very first project, the GovZero uh, movement, was budget.govzero.tw, and uh, it was born because at the time there was this national economic boosting up plan, and there was this YouTube video filmed by the National Development Council at the time uh, that basically shows a bunch of citizens looking uh, like very confused by a lot of budget numbers, and there's a voiceover that says, you know, the economic plan is very complicated, the budget is impossible to explain, but it's okay, just trust the government and the government will make it right and just you know do do the thing and and so um, it was very quickly flagged as spam on YouTube. I think that's the worst first uh, for a like a government sponsored advertisement to be flagged as spam. Uh, but uh, also the people were really angry because people felt that if um, the government feel that the national annual budget is incomprehensible by citizens, maybe it's not the citizens' fault. Maybe it's just the visualization is bad and there is no direct communication with public servants. And so uh, they forked the government budget website and built a beautiful tree map, bubble map, and for each and every um, tracked item of the budget, there's a, um, like, you can ask for more, you can ask for less, you can say that you don't understand that, and you can ask questions among uh, the people. And the beauty of the GovZero movement is that most of our projects like this are, uh, we relinquish our copyright under Creative Commons Zero. And so so on the next procurement cycle, when the government thinks it's a good idea, then it just becomes a government website. And so uh, now this system powers not just the participatory budget uh, program of Taipei City and five other cities, but uh, just last month becomes a part of the national uh, e-participation platform that you can track thousands of uh, government projects and the KPIs and the procure procurements and spendings they made. But most critically, each uh, budget item becomes a social object that you can just type in whatever you want to ask and a career public servant would answer to you without going through indirections such as um, MPs, right? So that's the basic idea. It's making uh, the budget not um, a complex, incomprehensible whole, but as a specific social object that people can have real discussions on. And so, um, so why are there so many civic hackers looking at each government website and trying to make it better? And uh, during the Occupy, we all to talk to our respective uh, companies, like I was working with Apple on Syria at the time, and say, I have to take a three-week leave because democracy needs me. <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> that's because our generation, I'm 37 now, um, we're the first generation that enjoyed the freedom of speech in Taiwan after three decades of martial law and of dictatorship. And so the freedom arrived in 1989, the year of personal computers. So for us, personal computer revolution and freedom of speech is the same thing, and the first president election by popular vote in 1996 was also the year that Wild Web got popular. So internet and democracy, they're not two things, they're one of the same thing. In Taiwan, with the same generation, it's not two kinds of people, it's the same generation of people who get to work on democracy. And so for the past 30 years in Taiwan, when we see free software, we always think freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and never free of cost, because we know that freedom is never free of cost. Our parents' generation paid dearly for it. And so we need to use the software freedoms today to keep it free, as we did during the Occupy movement. Now, the movement back in 2014 caused a revolution, although it's a kind of peaceful revolution. Uh, there was a radical transformation of social expectations at the 
end of 2014. And many occupiers just accidentally found themselves elected mayors when they, they did not expect it. It's something that happened in Spain during the 15M movement and, and you know that wave of occupiers. And because of that, the prime minister at the time, Jiang Yihua, resigned, and a new prime minister in engineer said, okay, from now on, crowdsourcing and open data are just going to be the national direction. And the uh, occupiers and the civic tech people like us who supported them were then invited as mentors and advisors to the public service to solve issues uh, like global issues, wicked problems that nobody knows how to solve, uh, like Uber at a time. And Uber is very interesting because it is a meme. Uh, it is a virus of the mind. The meme at the time in 2015 was called, quote unquote, sharing economy. Uh, but the payload of that meme is essentially that code knows better how to dispatch cars than laws. So why don't we just ignore laws and just believe in code? So that was the payload of this particular virus of the mind. Uh, and this meme spread through apps from drivers to passenger to drivers. And uh, you can't really argue with a meme just like you can't argue with the flu. It's not in the same category. Uh, it may be that a private driver, after trying UberX for a while, uh, decides not, not a good idea. So it's like the flu is, gets better, but it's already spread because of that. So there's protests, just like protests elsewhere in the world. The taxi drivers surround the Ministry of Transport, demanding negotiation and so on. And so for us, the solution was then to uh, discover a way to solve this from an epidemic perspective. How can we involve thousands of stakeholders and inoculate them against very divisive PR agenda that people on all different sides are putting forward on public media? And so uh, we thought that since we just did a demonstration, a demo of uh, deliberation with half a million people, we can scale it down to thousands of people and do a deliberation, which we mean deliberation by thinking deeply with something um, that everybody has a stake in, thinking deeply together, and we think it's an effective vaccine against such virus of mind. So when everyone, like passengers and drivers, academics, public servants, listen to one another and form a consensus, they become naturally immune to device of PR campaigns in the future. So um, very quick recap of the first day of our workshop, <laughs> which is the deliberation method that we use is called a focused conversation method that's invented in Canada. Um, so the FCM or the ORID method involves four stages. The first stage is the facts where we collect evidence and uh, objective data. But based on the objective data, after that is confirmed, we move to collect everybody's feelings. And it's very important to set aside some time for every Everybody to confirm everybody else's feelings because for the same fact I may feel angry you may feel happy and it's all okay and it is only after confirming everybody's feelings that we move on to the ideas or the brainstorming stage where the best ideas are the ideas that take care of most people's feelings and finally we translate them into legalese and sign them into decisions so that's the um, facts the feelings the ideas and finally decisions um, however, if the decision-making process is not transparent, then people in the street and people in the you know, establishment, usually uh, when they see the same word, they mean very different things. So they're not even agreeing on basic facts, let alone each other's feelings. And in that situation, ideas become ideologies, a virus of the mind that's even more potent, uh, that they can blind people uh, from new facts and to each other's feelings. So to address this uh, situation. The first step is open data, and it's not just open government data. It is uh, asking all the stakeholders from the private sector and the civil society to contribute objective data that they can bring to the table and that we can look at and then ask what people feel about those objective data. And so uh, we use a AI-moderated uh, conversation uh, called Polis. It's an open source system uh, to ask about how people feel. And four groups of people soon emerge they are taxi driver, Uber driver, Uber passenger, and other passengers, and it shows how their sentiments are received by other groups. But the important thing here is that it's your Twitter and Facebook friends all over the place, so they're not like nameless enemies or anything. Um, it shows that it's people, reasonable people can stand on different sides and feel very differently, uh, and we become, again, a social object. And uh, people can just write in their feelings in the system and rate on each other's feelings, whether they agree or not. 
not. And as you click agree or disagree, your avatar will move toward the people that feel uh, similarly as you do. And so the entire group may also uh, just coalesce to the middle as people propose more and more eclectic and more and more resonating um, ideas. And so um, this way of doing uh, discussion is very different from the usual social media where there is a reply button. There is no reply button here. And so one can only add to the discussion and one cannot distract from the discussion. And so we deployed many different systems uh, throughout our experiments, but there's one common thing in it is that there's no reply button and people can only add to it, they cannot subtract from it. And so instead of distracting, we say that anyone who proposed any feeling that resonates with a super majority of people, uh, we agree to be bound by that as the agenda to negotiate with Uber and other taxi unions and companies. And so in a typical polis conversation, um, we this become um, the face of the crowd. People can see how many groups there are, how much they agree or disagree on different things, and very interestingly, the trolls don't get to waste people's time. The most divisive statements, they are identified as divisive, but they're just that. And because we encourage people to dive even more deeply into more and more resonating statements that attracts more consensus, people spend most of their time on the consensus statements and try to refine them into more and more acceptance. And so um, in other social media venues, uh, this chart may be flipped, right? But on um, Polis and other uh, more additive uh, spaces, we often see shapes like this where we end up uh, being able to harvest without uh, spending much time on moderation, uh, a set of consensus items that we can check in a live stream fashion with all the stakeholders saying this is the people's will and do you have any uh, problem accepting it and if not uh, how about we just ratify it this and that way and so um, the stakeholder agreed and because it's live streamed um, everybody know that it's coming uh, that everybody agreed on this set of consensus so when we ratify in August 2016 everybody anticipated it and now Uber operates legally but only with uh, professional drivers and rental cars and pay taxes and insurance and things like that. And the co-ops and the unions, they get to enjoy the same search pricing and other um, innovations that Uber has brought legally. So it's literally the best of both worlds. You can call some rental cars using the unions or co-ops apps, and you can call taxis using the Uber app. And everything is kind of um, anticipated because of this uh, deliberation that involves thousands of uh, stakeholders. So this method really works. And so the next question question is, can we scale this process of listening? We call it scalable listening. So right after this ratification, I joined the cabinet as the digital minister to explore the possibility uh, through PIDIS, the public digital innovation space. So we're a little bit like, like Policy Lab in the UK. Uh, it's a digital service at the national levels, and we have designers, programmers, and we're automating away a lot of those chores uh, that public servants are doing in order to make participation not just possible, but also fun. Um, so yeah, that's one of the emphasis <laughs> that we did uh, in the past two days workshop, is just to make participation fun. Uh, so a lot of it is not technical. A lot of it is uh, cultural. For example, I'm a radically transparent digital minister. By, by that, I mean that all the journalists, all the lobbyists, everybody get to ask me questions, but only publicly. If I get questions from a private email, I will reply and ask if it's okay to give my answer publicly, but if not, I'll just give them links to what my previous statements are. <laughs> and it's not just to um, the lobbyists uh, and journalists, uh, like the, the David Plouffe here. Uh, we, we talk about Uber at the time he was speaking for Uber, but all these things are not just, um, you know, on the record, it's on 360 record so we can put on VR and revisit the conversation <laughs> but it's also keeping the transcript form uh, and it's not just for external lobbyists it's also for internal meetings so for all the hundreds of internal meetings that I held since I was the digital minister everything was transcribed and published as structured data on the internet so that was the written record for everything everybody said during the meetings and we send them to participants to check for 10 days and then publish online uh, and the effect of this is actually very surprising 
surprising. The career public servants actually become more innovative and more risk-taking when they know that uh, after editing for 10 working days, all the internal meetings are published to the internet. And that's because previously, before we introduced radical transparency, if uh, we come up with some innovation and things go really well, it's always the minister that gets the credit. But if, <laughs> if it goes really wrong, then the journalist has some way to find out uh, what is the career public servants that's doing wrong since the minister has such a wonderful vision and they would get the blame uh, when things go wrong. And so there, there was no incentive to innovate at all uh, when, when, when you have a, a political appointee uh, behaving uh, to harvest uh, all the credit and share the blame. But with this completely radically transparent accountable record, if things go right, they actually get a credit because their name is on the transcript. Uh, and I introduced people to the, the uh, low-level or mid-level public servant that came up with the wonderful idea in the first place. And so because it's an experimental method, if things go wrong and they do go wrong, it's all the digital ministers' fault because as uh, far as I know, I'm the only minister in the world that's doing this. So <laughs> under this condition, people become very innovative and open to a lot of very interesting ideas. And one of the ideas uh, they adopted was this thoroughly free software platform called Sandstorm as our public service internal platform. So we get to use the same tools that people use for collaboration. Davros is like Dropbox, uh, Intercalc is like Google Spreadsheet and Google Docs, and Weekend is like Trello, uh, like uh, we have Rocky Channel, which is like Slack. And so how the free software community is organizing around ourselves these days, we are also using it in public service. And previously, the roadblocks was the cybersecurity issue since the open source development method is essentially strangers writing arbitrary patches. Um, the, <laughs> the, the internal public service had a lot of difficulty convincing ourselves to deploy uh, free software as our internal tool. But because the Sandstorm, the underlying cybersecurity uh, solution uh, is is itself a free software tool that solves the cybersecurity problem through sandboxing. So it gets audited by our cybersecurity department and by a lot of white hat hackers. So we convince ourselves that uh, all the free software on top of it doesn't suffer from cybersecurity attacks. And because of that, the um, public servants can go wild and implement with just a few lines of JavaScript whatever uh, system that they need to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we have one for ordering lunch boxes together that we use every week. Uh, and things like and planning trips together and things like that. And so I think this is really good to have this choice of uh, internal innovation. And also, we have this e-petition platform <clears throat> as a way for people to participate. It was like the uh, We the People platform here in the US. Uh, but in the beginning, the joint platform has a reputation uh, of uh, if it's a single ministry issue, people will often get a real dialogue. But for any and all cross-ministry issue, people will just get the explanation rather than a solution. They will get this very blank, very bureaucratic answers that doesn't really solve their problems, but just explains why this particular ministry cannot do much about it because it's a cross-ministerial issue. <laughs> so after I become the digital minister, we asked each ministry to allocate a team, at least one person, but now like five people in the COA now, um, like many people uh, in larger ministries to serve as participation officers. So this is a virtual network of around 60 people now, and we communicate online using Rocket Chat and all those collaborative tools and uh, just show each other how to do online and offline engagement. So now in Taiwan, when people start a petition, they know that instead of just a dutiful response, they will actually get to meet with all the relevant agencies and ministries, uh, either in Taipei if it's a national issue or we will actually trade, uh, travel to those uh, rural areas like Hangchun and even offshore islands like Penghu uh, if they're petitioning for their local development or environmental issues. So we solve a lot of very interesting issues like uh, this one uh, without exposing any public servants to risk. Uh, and the goal is to relieve the fear, uncertainty, and doubt around civic participation so people can put the fun uh, into uh, engaging people who are petitioners and invite people who are really experts. So so, for example, we have a petitioner last May uh, who petitioned that for Mac and Linux and tablet users, the national income tax filing software is explosively hostile to use. Uh, and so instead of uh, just explaining the problem as the um, career public servants are often um, you know, just doing uh, year after year before uh, last year, uh, we actually
actually brought it up uh, to the PO network and the PO from the Minister of Finance, uh, Yang Jingheng here, who brought it up. Uh, these are full credit because instead of waiting for it to reach 5,000 people, that was a threshold to response, he brought it to the PO network when there's only like 50 people um, like complaining about it. And then, uh, so we invite anyone who complain into the kitchen, so to speak, to co-create the new tax filing system of this year with a lot of critical acclaim. Uh, and so through this kind of co-creation, people learn that they can contribute their expertise, not just as complaints, but as co-creation efforts. So by collaborating with the civic sector, we're now building a robust environment suitable for social innovation to grow, where the power of civil society can be brought into full place. And so it's, it was like this last year, and it's like this this year. But <laughs> the, the point here is that the venue where we hold these collaboration meetings are itself, uh, I think, uh, worthy um, of the name the Social Innovation Lab because it's shaped like this. Uh, and the um, Social Innovation Lab in Taipei near the Jianguo Flower Market uh, is itself a project co-created by hundreds of social entrepreneurs and social innovators. Um, and so the like this um, soccer field uh, is drawn by people with Down syndrome and they're like really artistically inclined and you see a lot of different people bringing different aspects of uh, their creation to this space and the space was formed through this responsive uh, methods where when people is just like Slido uh, vote on the thing that they really want and then uh, we just make it happen. So the first thing that they ask is that it for it to open until 11 p.m. every every day and, and we do that and the second most uh, asked thing is that there's a resident kitchen and a resident chef, and so we have that. Uh, and then it's open to anyone, right? And so they asked uh, the um, digital minister to be here uh, one day every week, so every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's my office hour in the social innovation lab, and anyone can come to talk to me as long as they agree to have the full uh, transcript published online. Um, <clears throat> after this personal office hour has been running for a few few weeks, I uh, observed that mostly people visit me if they live in Taipei or they, they you know, live to uh, very close to one of those high-speed rail stations. And that's not really good for the rural and indigenous uh, area development. So I start touring around Taiwan every other Tuesday. And so I will be in like Hualien or some other rural places. And even more rural or indigenous places can connect to me uh, through this kind of teleconference. But the point is that every time uh, in the Social Innovation Lab, all the relevant ministries often 12 of them or 13 of them are here in Taipei through teleconference seeing uh, I'm kind of like a investigative journalist <laughs> to bring them into the actual places where the social innovations happen and that they get to answer questions in real time responding to the need of the local social innovators. And so once the, the respective agencies here solve it in a kind of fashion, they publish it uh, online. So other ministry can also understand so this problem is to be resolved in this kind of a way. And so just by touring around Taiwan, we discover and disseminate a lot of social innovations uh, that makes it much more possible for them to collaborate and not working against uh, the national government. So I'll just use one example. Uh, this is another GovZero project. It's called the GovZero Air Pollution Observation Network. Um, and this is basically uh, a, a theme in Taiwan that people, although our environmental protection agency are going to have like thousands of uh, PM 2.5 and other air uh, quality sensors, if it's not uh, in people's balcony or in people's children's schools, uh, if it's not close enough to them, people don't put a lot of trust in those numbers. And so this is how uh, people just crowdsourced their own PM 2.5 and other air uh, pollution uh, monitor network. And there's like thousands of such sites and each one is maybe a little bit imprecise compared to the official ones, but it's close to where people live, and it's all automatically uh, uploaded and aggregated on the, <coughs> on the um, free software uh, platform um, called the, the LAS uh, system. And then uh, it's becoming very popular and apply a lot of IoT technologies so people can participate by providing either real-time air data or newer uh, analysis algorithms and things like that. And an exceptional event 
advantage of Taiwan is that the national government, when uh, met with this kind of civil um, substitute of legitimacy, uh, we offer full support instead of rejection, right? So we, we can't beat them, so we just join them. And so as part of the <laughs> forward-looking infrastructure plan, uh, we launched this uh, project called IoT for Public Good with a four-year budget of Taiwan, uh, five billion Taiwan dollars, so that's about 150 million uh, US dollars. And in the program, an enormous amount of environmental data on the air quality, but also meteorology, water resource, um, earthquake, disaster relief, etc. They're all integrated into this high-speed computing environment, so we can collaboratively discover the correlations between social activities and environmental phenomena while using exactly the same time. And the people, uh, the, the, date, uh, the data and the time series and so on are all kept and replicated even on the IOTA blockchain now. Uh, and so uh, p uh, data from various different sources are aggregated and the um, models uh, with various prediction ab abilities are for the first time uh, able to uh, compare on a orange by orange basis on the same shared data. And so we're also working with our uh, Industrial Technology Research Institute to assist with manufacturing of domestic, affordable, and high quality PM 2.5 detectors. And so why does the Taiwan government encourage such social innovations. I think that's because we really want democracy to work, and as I said in the ORID method, the first step is always the facts, the objective part. So if people can't even agree on the basic data that comprise of the you know current air quality, then it's impossible for people to have a real um, policy discussion. And so establishing effective dialogues are uh, the source of uh, democracy for us, and which is why we uh, sponsor this project project and it's spreading very quickly throughout the world. And so to speak, uh, we solve not just uh, our domestic issues, but through each and every such innovations we document uh, all this and uh, make it very easy to uh, spread uh, everywhere. And moreover, we have this idea of a sandbox act in Taiwan. And so now if you're experimenting, as I said, on blockchain uh, or very soon on self-driving, flying or in the sea or on the road vehicles, you can apply for experimentation to break the law for 12 months up to uh, three years if it, uh, the experimentation is successful. And during that 12 months, uh, any innovator um, can break laws, but one need to uh, explain why breaking those laws and regulations is good for the public, not just for one private sector. And during the experiment, we assemble that kind of a multi-stakeholder panel that collectively at the end of the 12 months experimentation period decide uh, whether the society impacted by this experiment think it's a good idea moving forward or if it's a bad idea. If it's a good idea, then we change the regulation and the laws because of this innovation. But if it's not a good idea, well, at least the risk is limited and we thank the investors for uh, paying you know, the tuition for everybody to learn something from it. And then people can learn, do something else um, you know, the next time. So that's <laughs> really this way. I think uh, we're using this controlled risk uh, experiment um, to basically contribute our experience, not just on one or two of the sustainable development goals, but uh, are, we are mainly focused in PETAs on SDG 17, which is cross-sectoral, international, cross-discipline uh, collaboration. So um, as promised, yeah, it's exactly 8 p.m. now, so I'll switch to uh, questions, but in conclusion, I would like to share a prayer uh, with you about um, how we are approaching the technology so that the technology she visits the human society instead of the other way around. And so the prayer goes like this. Um, when we see the internet of things, uh, let's make it a internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. Uh, when we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us remember that the plurality is here. Thank you very much. Thank you.
All right, so um, let's take some, some questions, and I may uh, cue other people from the Taiwanese delegate to answer those questions. <laughs> uh, so what's the most complex and difficult project where you've incorporated the techniques uh, that's shown here? Um, I would say that it is the uh, drafting of the um, the harmonization between the new company act and the need of social entrepreneurs. There's many different sub-movements in Taiwan, the UNUS uh, movement, the B Corp movement, the Benefit Corporation movement, uh, the Platform Cooperative movement. There's many movements uh, and in Taiwan that advocates for various ways to structure uh, themselves. And uh, in the V Taiwan method that I introduced, about Uber, about Airbnb, about every other <clears throat> like like purely technical things. Usually, we get by by just a few pre meetings, a few stakeholder meetings, and one large consultation live stream meeting, and that that's the end of it. But for the social enterprise harmonization into the company law uh, system, uh, we held no less than fifteen uh, regional meetings, uh, just going into very every corner in Taiwan because uh, the Aborigine, the indigenous uh, nations, uh, the, the farm-oriented uh, rural places, the um, the, peop, uh, the places with a lot of uh, immigrants, and um, you know they all have very different social conditions, and their organizations change um, accordingly because of that. So uh, just the, the word social entrepreneurship means very different things to people around different corners in Taiwan, and just to get a shared language just by building a lexicon that is generally agreed by all people who self-identify as social entrepreneurs, it took us 15 uh, such meetings. And each of them is, uh, as I said, uh, live streamed both ways uh, with the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei and all the different ministries um, involved. And that is actually how those ministries build a shared lexicon. Also, because it turns out that every ministry treats social enterprise with very different definitions too. So, so it, it took us 15 uh, meetings with a lot of uh, like socially disadvantaged group, we have to go there and use maybe 360 streaming, maybe uh, real-time captioning, maybe um, we haven't done machine translation to sign language yet um, or, or to indigenous languages yet, but we're, we're uh, seriously prompted by that experience to develop uh, such technologies. But at the end, people achieve a broad understanding of what social entrepreneurship ne uh, needs at this stage in Taiwan and achieve a broad set of consensus, so we expect uh, uh, the parliament to ratify it about two weeks from now, and so it is a major achievement of the v Taiwan process adapting to something that is thoroughly not digital, and using digital only in an assistive civic technology role, and not as a, you know, a platform where people have to come, because otherwise we will exclude a lot of uh, these people and lose a lot of the diversity. And all, all these records are on the Social Innovation Lab and also on the v Taiwan TW website. Um, Liz would like to know, were any questions asked during the past two days that struck people from Taiwan as particularly revealing of differences in our democracies? That's a very good question. Anyone from Taiwan would like to take that question? Um, may I ask Fang Rui? Uh, Fang Rui. Where's Fang Rui? Uh, where's Fang? Uh, uh, she's somewhere else. Well, then it would be Avros then. <laughs> uh, Avros was the main facilitator of the first day. <laughs> and so, um, are there any questions asked that, that, that you still remember, really? Um, no? Yeah, have the mic, please. Yeah, use the mic. Yeah, yeah or Ningfen would like to take a question. Okay. All right. Um, so um, just to just just their bootstrapping their thought process. Uh, <laughs> um, 
There, there's, there's one question uh, that asks about the role of the MPs and uh, the parties uh, and the, the Taiwan uh, administration. And there, there's a real difference because constitutionally, um, a lot of this process of policy drafting is because in Taiwan, the administration is the place where the draft bills are formed and they're sent to the parliament uh, for adjustment. But the skeleton, the, the main uh, meat of the, the drafted bill is formed by career public servants and by the ministers instead of the MPs. And uh, while the president is uh, directly elected, she appoint the premier uh, and over the cabinet. And so the cabinet are uh, relatively shielded from party politics. And in fact, um, in the past few years, in the cabinet, there's more independent ministers than ministers of any party. And, and this is a very different uh, atmosphere because we get to work on this progress, uh, on this process in a largely nonpartisan, not bipartisan, nonpartisan uh, kind of way. And just after we bring this draft bill to the parliament, do the parties really start uh, to work on it? And I think this is constitutionally somewhat different from the US model of uh, lawmaking. Yeah. So anyone want to add it? No? OK, oh well. Um, does Frau Van Rey want to say something about where uh, there any question asked during the past two days that really strikes you as, wow, there's, there's a context uh, difference that I really have to explain about Taiwan? Yeah, during the two-day workshop. Yeah. It is, it is. It's an open-ended question, the best kind of question. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more on the question so I can understand yeah, it better? Yeah, so this is right there, so. <laughs> Hi, sorry for asking such a difficult question. <laughs> um, I, I just was imagining that um, people coming from one country to explain their process to a whole room full of people um, working in a different country, that um, actually the, any gaps between what's happening one place and what's happening another might be revealed by the way that people ask you questions. And um, I just wonder if you got shocked by anything or, or if you thought Americans were cynical or uh, anything like that. <laughs> Not really, actually. I think it's more about sharing um, our enthusiastic and like what I, what I spoke to Dino earlier and some of the folks earlier on, they were like building similar things, similar models, try to um, engage people more and how to facilitate people to build consensus on certain things. I think I think that's, that is something that struck me the most. I didn't expect that um, there are lots of people um, are working on similar things and we can share with each other. And also me and Dino were talking about that we should document all of our process. And so we can, and also why we're using those methodologies and processes because um, we have different problems and different situations, but sometimes we are facing similar um, problems and we can all solve it together and if we can build on everyone's approaches then we have a good resource um, of how how we can do and what we can do um, when we face different challenges so we feel like to, um, uh, during this trip I feel like I have a, a stronger peer support about we can we can all work together in the future it sounds too optimistic I'm sorry about that <laughs> Yeah, um, the, the PETIS is a bunch of extremely optimistic people, so. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so if nobody chimes in, we'll move on to the next question. Um, um, how do you ensure representative samples? It seems that many of those would have stakeholders that would not be a technique technologically adept. Uh, for example, people who don't take taxis and therefore is not contacted uh, with regard to the Uber case. This is a fair question. We, we worry about representativeness 
uh, in two um, different scenarios. The first is if this is decisional in nature, if this is a, like a national referendum, or if this is a something that is immediately binding, then of course we need to be very wary of the at least statistical representativeness, but also maybe elective representativeness of people involved. But this is nothing of that sort. Um, this all the, all the binding power of this process is <coughs> finding out collectively the agenda that people feel as important thing to discuss with the you know Uber and taxi unions and things like that. So it is an agenda setter. In um, design thinking um, methodology, the police process takes care of maybe this part and up to a little bit of automated convergence to this part. But it doesn't move, um, it moves only almost halfway, but not even halfway, uh, to, to this decisional part. So all this does is that it clears up everybody's misconceptions. Uh, it allows people to discover each other's feelings, but without agreeing uh, necessarily on the problem statement and the solution statement going forward. This is the place where we do through face-to-face -face, uh, deliberation uh, that's live streamed in the consultative meeting. And because of this, the software that we choose for it is opinionated on this. Uh, you would notice that these numbers do not correspond to the area. This uh, measures diversity, not um, numbers. So if, for example, 1,000 people more came in and voted exactly the same as this person here, although the number in group C will be 1,242, the shape will not change. So if trolls or people mobilized in some way go here and vote exactly the same, they will not contribute to the diversity and therefore is meaningless uh, on, on this map. This map measures only the diversity in people's feelings. And so this is a very different way of looking at representation. This is a representation of people's feelings where everybody just talk about their own feelings, but the space itself encourage people to uh, find more feelings that resonates more with one another over time. And because this is deployed at an early enough stage and it's neither binding in a decisional way, nor agenda setting in an irrevocable way. It's very early, so it can precede any democratic process. We can use this process before a participatory budgeting. Um, we can use this before I voting. We can do this before referendum. We can do it before a, a poll. It's called a deliberative poll that way. And we can introduce this kind of uh, systems before any other more binding processes where representation would be more uh, important. That being said, we of course uh, can work and should work with more grassroots organization that spread this uh, participation through um, proxies or through uh, just internet empowerment um, like digital opportunity centers in Taiwan. Because after all in Taiwan, because of our geography, uh, we, when we say, when Dr. Tsai Ing-wen say in her presidential promise that broadband is a human right, uh, we actually deliver it. Uh, we are more than 80% internet penetration um, use rate now, and we're looking to increase it to almost 100% um, in the next um, couple uh, decades. I think our, our next decade actually is uh, oriented toward providing free broadband to people who cannot afford it and free tablets for people who cannot afford it. So if at any point in Taiwan people cannot go on this online platform to read about things, it's always the government's fault. And so the internet uh, broadband as human right, we really feel uh, very strongly about it, but we of course still should and we do work with social entrepreneurs uh, in less, um, in the areas less uh, inclined to use uh, this kind of technology and use it in a more assistive tech kind of way. What is my favorite science fiction story? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, a, a recent one is uh, called Story of Your Life, uh, written by someone whose family has been in Taiwan, Ted Jiang, uh, Jiang Fengnan, uh, and, and it's been uh, made into a film called Arrival, I believe. Uh, it's about this giant October uh, aliens that came to uh, the earth and speak only in emojis. Uh, <laughs> 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 
but maybe not exactly emojis, <laughs> but, 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 but pictograms, pictograms, yes, yes. Um, yeah, ink, multi-dimensional emojis. Uh, <laughs> right? And, and I, I think uh, I like this story, especially because uh, it conveys this um, idea of uh, a holistic understanding of things, of things as a network, uh, of things that are uh, what we try to uncover through a lot of those mind mapping and facilitative processes that let people kind of step outside their own shoes and into the timelines of other people, so to speak, uh, and to, to form a, a more coherent whole. So that is uh, one of my favorite science fiction stories that just came to my mind. Sometimes the will of the majority harms the minority. How does the process ensure that this doesn't happen? Yeah, the, the person who, who wrote Polis, uh, Colin McGill, uh, and his um, Mary Band of Friends, um, uh, actually taught uh, Habermas in, in high school <laughs> and in the civics. Uh, and so, <laughs> so he feels really strongly like if there is a group E here that has a very different sentiment from everybody else, but it's just three people, uh, those three people get their place on the map, and uh, they're considered as a group. And to reach supermajority of resonation, uh, your your statement still need to convince more than half of Group E to be counted into our heuristic of uh, a statement that resonates with majority of all the different uh, people. So it's through this way that we uh, uncover um, the will of the minority and also give them a chance to be evaluated and amplified and even merged into a resonating statement that people still find common value with the so-called minority. So this process is designed with diversity in mind, and it will uh, amplify the smaller, uh, in number, uh, diversified uh, thoughts into something that people can resonate just by virtue of uh, asking people to add to the minority voices instead of you know, drowning them out uh, in uh, trolls or in other more um, non-productive uses of online engagement. What kind of offline engagement do you believe is needed to have a vibrant online democracy? This is such a great question. Um, we can have like three day seminar on this, but <laughs> just to, just to, to um, introduce some, some basic things. Um, I, I really think the, the experience of listening um, as someone who's tuned to other people's like nonverbal um, uh, ways of expressing where their focus are and where whether they're interested or not and their like body movement and so on uh, we we can of course with very high bandwidth like gigabits of bandwidth and like 8k of resolution and um, holograms maybe duplicate one tenth <laughs> of that but that is still not commonly deployed yet so as a result of that any teleconferencing any two-dimensional maybe even you know um, 1080p um, resolution still necessarily drops many micro expressions and it is a feature of the human brain to fill in the, the gaps when the micro expressions are missing but they are mostly psychologically speaking projections and so um, it's easy to across the teleconference to feel that people agree um, a lot uh, but uh, in fact there's a lot of uh, subtleties that only gets revealed uh, through face-to-face -face deliberations in a very fine resolution. So before our technology gets there with 5G network and mixed reality and everything like that, uh, you know, like three years in the future perhaps, um, still I think it makes a lot of sense for all the stakeholders to converge on a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting, which is why we have the Social Innovation Lab, which is why we have this listening culture where people can all just come and uh, allocate a space and practice listening to each other before we scale this kind of listening out. And uh, so I think this kind of face-to-face -face listening and facilitation in an open space that are, are still needed for a vibrant online democracy because then when people fill in through projections uh, to the missing bits, uh, be it to a textual forum or to a, um, you know, a, f a lower resolution uh, live stream, it will not just be personal projections but reflections of the prior interactions that people have for people who with similar life experience and that uh, empathy building of people with very different life experience as, uh, as one uh, personally is, I think it's very important uh, for the online deliberation to happen in a truly deliberative manner. 
Uh, do you think a leaderless society is really possible? Yes, uh, and as I said, it's called the internet society is still around, right? <laughs> so um, I think at leaderless doesn't mean structureless, right? Uh, there is a lot of ad, ad hocacy uh, structure within any this kind of self organization uh, uh, public. But I think one of the key uh, themes that throughout those two day workshop is the idea of a recursive public. A uh, recursive public is a public that is aware of its own limitations of self-awareness and uh, is interested in making positive changes in increasing the awareness of this reflective awareness. So <laughs> again, it is like an organism that is trying to be more self-aware and you see this kind of recursive public in the free software community, in the internet society, in Wikipedia, in other not exactly structureless but striving to be leaderless um, organizations organizations are in self-organization that try to negotiate with the contextual environment and this is the the spirit the, uh, that we try to cultivate the recursive public once you get infected <laughs> with that kind of thinking you can see a of zero in any GOV establishment and one can f always fork uh, that is to say take what the establishment has already established, but taking it into a different direction. And with luck, if it succeeded uh, to a degree, then merge it back uh, to the originating society. That is always uh, how the free software community has organized ourselves. In the US, um, the influence of money on political processes produced a structurally unequal system. How might a framework like of zero overcome the power of money? This is a great question. Um, so, so it works on multiple levels. Um, first is that creativity or a, a true co-created consensus is one of the things that money cannot buy. Uh, even if you throw any amount of money into it, you, you cannot magically get something that uh, is shared value by people and that people can live with. Uh, actually, you often get the opposite. So I, I think it's very important to uh, position ourselves as um, a methodology that works within an existing um, private sector, civil society, public sector uh, relationship. And we call sometimes uh, this um, construction a plural sector in a sense that it, it in exchange, uh, it allows the people with money but cannot buy you know, um, goodwill or consensus to channel that amount of money or resources into construction projects like the social innovation space where the money really has no string attached and people do really co-create uh, this listening space. And uh, But that is actually for the greater good and the people with the money that put into it gets the first-hand experience into how this kind of um, co-ops really um, happen and form and things like that. So it is, I think, possibly my personal experience to convince the really um, wealthy uh, to put their money to positive social impact once you can demonstrate that there is a tangible way to convert that into positive social impact. Uh, and this is, of course, an area of like uh, venture philanthropy and social impact investment that also is part of the social enterprise uh, law framework that we took uh, more than a year uh, to deliberate on. Um, I work with people who often fear retaliation for speaking, such as undocumented immigrants. How might we have them part of co-creation radical honesty? So this is why we insist on having anonymous input uh, into all our uh, co-creation meetings and workshops. Even among people who are in the room, there may be power imbalances and people don't want to be identified. Uh, and we always encourage people to post such ideas and even on polis or on Slido, on, on Join, on other systems, uh, they are evaluated only by the merit of the, their input and not uh, by the, the real name. We, we never ask real name of those online participants. But perhaps over time, after being seen as taken care of and included in the conversation, sometimes those people do show up uh, under a pseudonym or eventually under a real name after like two years uh, and, and become very valuable members in the um, collective recursive public, maintain 
maintaining the VTLM process, not just visiting it, but it takes a very long time and it could be arbitrarily long for people to move from anonymous to, to pseudonymous uh, to, to re, on a real name basis. Uh, and, and I think the tolerance of the system on trolls, I think, is um, a, a testimony of how much anonymity we can admit to this uh, system. And this is true because, again, the lack of reply button, I don't know how to maintain both anonymous input and reply button. It is an open challenge, <laughs> but, but so far the way we mitigate this is just by taking away the reply button. Um, so um, can you tell us more about this PDIS unit and how it works? Is everyone an anarchist? Um, I think only, only myself, um, like Bill, myself as a conservative anarchist, uh, which is just a very um, fun way to say Taoist. Uh, but the, the idea, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right. So um, the conservation part, meaning that um, I'm not using the you know, some anarchists, they, they use more disruptive and violent tools and try to make a world um, that is distinct from everything that was before. But the conservative part meaning, you know, forking uh, what's already there, taking, recognizing, and respecting uh, what's already there, but just taking into a more leaderless, more anarchistic direction and also respecting the tradition of the internet society and the anarchistic way of doing things as they have already done in the past few decades. And so that, that's just me. Uh, and so um, in PETIS, we, we pride ourselves as, uh, you know, nobody really orders anyone to do anything, uh, but we do abide by these four pillars of open government uh, and with trust uh, as our common, common call. And so, yeah, we, we had some uh, mind mapping ourselves. Um, we, we did it in our anniversary, um, about 25 full-timers uh, at a time, uh, and about 35 interns this year. So we're a sizable unit, uh, and we established that our number one priority is to uh, build trust between the government uh, and the civil society. That's priority one. Priority two, being empowering the civil society. So that whereas people think it takes the government to do something, actually the social innovation um, culture lets people think uh, we don't need the government, we can do it ourselves. So this kind of empowerment culture is our priority too. And priority three is to simplify the workflow of pu career public servants so that the public service, when they hear about public participation, they think you know more credit, less risk, and less work, and instead of more work and uh, more risk and less credit. And so this is very important uh, to make Pareto, uh, Pareto improvements to the um, public service workflow so that they can see uh, the the protesters really as inputs uh, and valuable uh, members in the co-creation kitchen rather than just mobs, right? So, and there's some associate uh, smaller goals like make public servants um, eager to innovate while absorbing all the risk of failure. So we hold, for example, three months long presidential hackathons in co collaboration with the president's office. Uh, the, the one for this year just, just concluded. So hundreds of public servants send their uh, ideas of how to improve the public service on particular presidential promises. <laughs> And sometimes, actually, they do it pseudonymously. They do it by uh, sending it to their civil society or private sector friends, have them propose to the president, and say, we're just you know, working with the team. Uh, but actually, it's been on their shelf for like four years. <laughs> and so um, I, I think uh, the, the teams participating in the presidential hackathon, they're not there for the money, because there's no award, no monetary award. There's a very beautiful trophy, but that's it. Uh, but the, the reward of being in the top five team is the presidential promise to solve all the regulatory and silo uh, issues and be integrated into the public service starting next fiscal year. And that is the presidential promise of the presidential hackathon of the three months uh, thing. And in this uh, area, the public servant who proposed this um, gets all their risk absorbed by the president's office and, and um, basically gets all the credit when they get a trophy. Uh, and I think this is one of the areas 
areas where we can work more to get people to uh, understand the uh, uh, value of digital service, of the malleability of it, of the possibility to do a lot of pilot of it, and uh, to really co-create something of value to all constituents and encourage this kind of hackathon or civic hacker culture inside the public uh, service. So I think many people in PDS would be very comfortable uh, describing themselves as a civic hacker, but maybe not all the way to an anarchist yet. Um, we are in a room where buy-in to those technical system prowess level is high. How do you ensure this participation are reflective of all the peoples? We don't. Um, so when we go to indigenous nations, when we go to the rural areas, when people in the Taipei city use the joint platform to debate uh, how to allocate social housing uh, to socially disadvantaged people and using the stakeholder discovery methods and a lot of assistive civic tech to make sure that disadvantaged people become the agenda set each different case use a very different configuration of technology, sometimes assistive, sometimes facilitative, and try just to get the diversity there. So it, it's not about technology. The technology is uh, custom and tailor-made to fit the need of the population uh, and the diversity that's needed to have a uh, reasonable common value um, discovery process. Um, how is your team structured? What do you look for when you hire two new team members? That's two related questions. Um, so <laughs> our team is, is very uh, interesting because ministers with our portfolio are literally just ministers with our portfolio. We don't have a digital ministry. Uh, the M MWOP position in the Taiwan cabinet are essentially, we have nine people who look after the issues that either no ministry want to take charge of, like eSport, uh, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> and allocate responsibility to the ministries involved, uh, or uh, work with issues that all the ministries want to have something to say, like sharing economy, uh, and figure out something, or, or social enterprise, and, and make sure that everybody knows what's going on and agree on common values. And so uh, each minister with a portfolio is supposed only to have like one or two staff, uh, but as I said, we have more than 20 full-timers and 35 interns, so where, where does those people come from? <laughs> so it, it turns out uh, that uh, each ministry, uh, we accept up to one volunteer from each ministry to join the office, but they still rate themselves. They, I don't rate their performance. They rate their own performance. And so because Taiwan has 32 ministries, I can have technically 32 people on the staff. And we also ask one person to come from uh, each, inst uh, each division within the industry, um, the Information Industry Institute. Uh, and so that's six more people. And so, so that is how how it's done. And in software development, this is called on-site customer. The idea is that all the innovation that we do, we don't do it out of thin air. We do it because one of those on-site customers that is also a career public servant think such an innovation is good for their ministry or their council, and they need to get buy-in from the peers in the PETIS office. And so the feasibility is never a question, because I, I don't come up with new ideas. <laughs> those people who station uh, into my office, come up with the ideas. And then if it's about public participation, it's additionally vetted by the 60 participation officers around all the different ministries. So this is like two levels of crowd wisdom within the administration to make sure that whatever we do is a net improvement uh, in credit and net reduction in risk and in human resource cost. Uh, and what do I look for when I hire new members? Um, I, I look for people who give at least as much as they take. Uh, and I look for people who can master new skill sets uh, that are currently uncovered, uh, not covered by any existing members in PETIS. So they're complementary to the existing team. And with these two um, attributes, I don't need to do any management. People just go wild and help each other. <laughs> right. So, uh, Noel would like to know, how do you incentivize, incentivize CIOs, that's deputy ministers in Taiwan, to integrate your POs into their workflow? Um, sometimes the deputy ministers, they're politically appointed, uh, like in the um, Agriculture Council's case, the deputy minister was himself a sunflower occupier uh, and an activist in the rural front of Taiwan. <laughs> and so I, I don't think uh, Ji Zhong needs convincing <laughs> of the power of democracy <laughs> because uh, he, he advocates for 
for it uh, during the Occupy and with his um, uh, prowess in economic analysis. But in, in other deputy ministers who are more of a career public servant background, as I said, uh, that's three main things. It's a net reduction in cost, it's a net reduction in risk, and it is a net increase in credit. We don't have to establish all three at once, but those three are not fungible. You cannot make one of the suffer to exchange the other two. So at least uh, like do no harm and improve on one of those three areas. And because I make this really explicit and said, you know, uh, I only accept voluntary uh, proposals, uh, the ministers and deputy ministers soon learn that I'm not ordering them and commanding them to do anything. Basically, they come to me only if they think uh, there's something that could be solved by white engagement, public engagement practices. And so, yeah, I think this kind of voluntary association is why the uh, CIOs are uh, more inclined now to integrate POs into their work, especially now that we have some highlight cases like the income tax filing system and so on that uh, the entire country see as like really um, a good um, example of the open government and co-creation process. So because of time, the next few questions I'll answer briefly. Um, so um, how do you ensure law enacted are good as separate from popular? Um, we, we can't ensure that, but we, what we can do uh, in the idea of sandbox laws and in the idea of co-creation workshops is to provide room enough in the legislative system to have a rolling um, auto-correcting, really, a <laughs> uh, system uh, of, of a new implementation. Uh, the idea is that it takes just 60 days of a public consultation uh, for a regulation or policy change to take effect. And the sandbox laws are is essentially the parliament saying, you know, we let the multi-stakeholder mechanism take us wherever the innovation goes without, you know, ruling over it by specific laws. And so even if we're a continental law system, that still allows for sufficient room for innovations to, to try itself uh, on a two months by two months basis. And so just by allowing such kind of um, like improving the rules and norms on, on the fly, and sometimes in cases like AI's integration with society, like autonomous vehicles, really that is the only way that I think and can think of that allows people to co-domesticate with those new creatures uh, and uh, establish a safe norm that is generally accepted by the society. We can't just start from some abstract laws of robotics and accept that people uh, accept it on a top-down fashion. And so this kind of co-creation culture, I think, uh, really is complementary to this like vote every four years or two years, two bits of upload per four years um, uh, idea by having more symmetric bandwidth between people who are impacted by policy and people who can change uh, the policy incrementally. So it could be just popular at the beginning, but after um, a year, of actually trying out in the sandbox, maybe it turned out to not be not good after all, and people still have uh, the political will and the mechanism to correct it. What do you think of democratic practices in America? Well, um, so, <laughs> um, well, I, I think, well, I mean, you guys are pioneers. <laughs> we, uh, we, we learned um, most of the, the most, really most of the Taiwan's um, democratic um, institutions, we, we copied verbatim, like the, the joint platform, the e-petition platform was copied verbatim at the very first version from the We The People platform. And so is the National Open Data uh, platform. And so, um, for example, our referendum act explicitly referred to the Oracle model and, and things like that. So um, you, I, I see that you're one of the main upstreams, the sources uh, of the democratic innovations. But Taiwan, I think, is uh, special in that we don't have 200 years of representative democracy. We only have like 30 years or less of truly representative democracy, <laughs> and which is also less than 30 years of direct internet-based democracy. So for us, it's much more natural to fuse those two together and find something that's innovative that could complement uh, the shortcomings of both models instead of of saying, you know, there's a lot of legacy here and uh, some newcomers here is just the same generation of people. So I think we are in a culture where it's much more easy to iterate quickly. 
Um, so there's this chairperson of the Audrey Fan Club. Uh, <laughs> want to know what advice my, may I offer to friends and family who helped join the fight against systemic oppression in their everyday lives? What about diehard activists? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, um, my previously, before I'm a conservative anarchist, I was a crypto anarchist. And <laughs> the, the, one of the, the ideas that we had is that instead of fixing a system that's broken, we need to invent something that's manifestly better and that renders the original uh, system obsolete. It's a Buckminster Fuller uh, saying. Um, I, I wouldn't say that Bitcoin or Ethereum is the holy grail that we, we, we were looking for in the early 2000s or the late 1990s. But it's going that way. It is spreading the idea of a um, leaderless consensus while burning a lot of electricity. We really need to fix that. But uh, but uh, otherwise, I think it is really a good idea uh, of just showing alternatives and, uh, and and just living in the alternative and and having a lot of fun doing it. And and people will just discover the fun of living in the alternative world and maybe start seeing it as uh, feasible. And lo and behold, the old way or seen as outdated, and that may happen in our lifetime. So um, is there a risk? Yes. So y yes, there, there is. So um, it's important that our national participation platform, uh, currently about 5 million active users out of the 23 million population, uh, and we're, that's just with, what, three years of history, and so we're inc uh, looking to increase it even further so that uh, people are generally aware that such a platform exists. I think that is uh, our responsibility to really spread it uh, through every, everywhere. What would I do if I'm the Prime Minister of China? <laughs> well, such a diplomatically loaded question. Um, so <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I really have no idea. I, I, I mean, um, I, I, I don't know. And um, from what I've learned uh, working with um, people still in the civic tech community, although they, they may just call themselves social entrepreneurs or uh, social uh, innovators, um, I think there's a lot of uh, consensus making method and the facilitative method that is compatible not just with representative democracy but with Leninist centralized democracy and so uh, <laughs> um, so with the air quotes and so so I, I think um, even in um, places such as the PRC governed territory um, there is a lot of willingness and interest in learning this kind of uh, techniques and so we as any other free software community we embrace people from any part of the world and uh, teach them this method uh, to what end, I don't know. Uh, so when you analyze data of participants, um, yes, so we find, of course, young people participate more, but also retired people participate more, uh, I think because they have more time. <laughs> that, that is entirely um, the, the, the function of the available time that they have. And so uh, we, we try always to come up with things that you can do, like pressing yes or no, likes or not, um, that you can do in one minute's time and some more thing you can do in 10 minutes time like sharing uh, a, a open data or a factoid or something you can do on one hour time on one day time so it's a ladder of participation that we try to include people of all walks of life and all the different um, demographics and groups um, so how long do your engagement process remain open for how quickly from start to finish it depends, but usually uh, for the e-petition originated uh, proposals, we give a reply within 60 days, sometime extending to four months, but no more than four months. And so all our participatory meetings, collaboration workshops need to happen within this two months to four months um, time window. So we learn to be really efficient, uh, and there's a lot of structures, as you can see, uh, that we try to introduce to move this process along, and we can reasonably uh, get to a consensus now um, after just three weeks of preparation, but of course we can still uh, improve on that. What about Leaderful? Um, well, Leaderful is also great, I guess. Um, so uh, the, the, the thing is that the, the leader need to empower others so that they can too be leaders, right? So full of leaders. Um, so which is the same thing to say leaderless, right? So to have multi-centralism is the same as decentralism. So basically, uh, we are approaching it on two different uh, sides. The V Taiwan process is about civil society trying to engage the administration and the 
the PO network, about the administration, trying to engage the civil society. So one side being leaderless and one side being leaderful, but I think we do meet somewhere in the middle and that is uh, the, the ground where the real creativity and co-creation happens. Um, so what doesn't work? Uh, so far that we think um, th there's a lot of petition issues that are just refused flat out by the CIOs or deputy ministers to bring to the PO network. Um, sometimes they're highly politically um, motivated so that it's really the president's um, purview of doing these things. One case in point is that there's a petition about banning the flag of PRC in Taiwan, and that would be a presidential political decision. Uh, people are now trying to take it to the referendum platform now, uh, but that, uh, that is actually beyond what the process can do in a three week or two months uh, time frame because it's so um, politically charged and it is actually not within the administration or the cross ministries uh, purview. So we do have to say no uh, to a few petitions like this uh, when it's uh, being deliberated uh, by the PO network. Um, can housing be addressed adequately with respect with those uh, with limited resources? Um, there is uh, a related process. Uh, I, I didn't uh, do any of this, but uh, it's called e-participation of socially disadvantaged people, and it's one of the open government partnership presentations by uh, Liu Jiahua, and she uh, orchestrated Taipei social housing deliberation process uh, by having those disadvantaged people as the main agenda setters. So I would encourage you to read through the slides and the OGP uh, write-up. Uh, I don't have the time to go into that now, but I believe that there are certain composite collectives uh, trying <laughs> to bring some of these uh, ideas uh, into NYC housing, so please um, contact your friendly organizers locally uh, <laughs> to, to, to uh, work on this question. Uh, it, it really does take local organizers. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, so quality control, yes. So basically we just aggregate everything and then uh, we deploy uh, machine learning and other heuristics uh, that try to weed out uh, data that just doesn't agree uh, with any patterns and we actually crowdsource those uh, algorithm also. So there's a new paradigm called open algorithm where you can just crowdsource org algorithm and uh, make sure that it doesn't um, invade privacy if it's handling uh, personal data and but publishing the data in an aggregated form in a statistics form that's nevertheless very usable and com comparable. So if you're interested, you can look into the open algorithm project. That is the, the uh, direction we're going. Um, can I share examples from Sandbox? So um, yeah, um, so one thing that we see from the public service after the introduction of Sandbox is that when there's a new request from the civil society or from a social innovator, it used to be that the public service, it takes them nothing to say no, and if they say yes, they have to interpret the existing regulations and policies, it may take them seven days of work. But now with the FinTech Sandbox, if they say yes, it's just seven days of paperwork. If they say no, it enters the Sandbox and they have to spend six to 12 months with that idea. And so just by a pure cost reduction uh, you know, calculus, people tend to say yes to new innovations. So we were able to get, the, uh, for example, telemedicine and uh, you know, psychotherapy over the internet and a lot of healthcare related innovations just by the virtue of people saying, otherwise we're going to the sandbox. Uh, so that is one of the <laughs> uh, consequences of having a, a sandbox law. Um, what features do I think Slido can improve on? I think it's pretty good. I wish it's open source, but it's it's pretty good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, I think um, I think bootstrapping always starting with small alternative that enjoy itself. So it can start in any level. It could be just one collective, one house, or one apartment, one region, one block. Uh, you can always start at any level uh, to to bootstrap. The thirty five interns, some of them are right here in New York. Uh, so so um, I'm I'm the first teleworking minister. So I only work in the administration building every. Um, 
Monday and Thursday. And so otherwise, I'm just everywhere, right? Wednesday, I'm in the social innovation lab. Tuesday, I'm touring around Taiwan. Friday, I'm going to Penghu or whatever for collaboration meetings. Uh, and so all our work is um, telework. And because of that, and because of the cybersecurity system that I brought in, everybody in PETIS can work anywhere. So um, every year, uh, we recruit uh, 25 people last year, 35 this year, uh, to work as uh, people who look at all the government websites, like all 500 of them. And last year, they checked with tablets and notebooks. And this year, they checked with iOS and Android phones and make sure that the user experience stay consistent and, and fun uh, for all the government services. And it's not usually the case. And so people, uh, the, the college people, the interns, just look through all the different uh, government websites and identify the part that are broken or that are difficult to use. And then one third of them are who know CSS and JavaScript actually go into the reports and fix it and bringing gifts uh, to to the ministries. So the ministries love the PDS interns because instead of spending more money on procurement, they just bring gifts like five line changes and it really changed the experience of the website. So that is how our crowdsourced uh, interns uh, work. They, they fix the government services. And now we also have digital design interns that try to come up with all these structures for our facilitation. Is this my first time in the US? No, actually. If not, <laughs> what did I accomplish or didn't accomplish last time? My last visit was also in New York City. It was PDF last year. And <laughs> I, I, I gave a talk. <laughs> and that led to, to today's uh, collaboration. So the achievement, I think, is just bringing all the people from PDF so that they're not just random people that appear in my slides, but actually in the flesh people who can have a real interaction with you <laughs> in the facilitation. And uh, I look forward to more concrete collaborations in the future. How do I self-regulate? Uh, yes, uh, um, it is a, a fair question, actually. Um, so um, I, I was born with this congenial like heart defect that um, basically the doctors tell me that I have like 50% chance of living to um, 12 years old where I get my heart surgery. So everything is fine now, but I always live with this idea uh, that when I fall into sleep, I may not uh, wake up uh, the next day. And so this become a part of my core personality so that when I found this idea of the free software or open innovation society, I always make sure that by the end of the day, I push all my Git commits or subversion commits or CVS commits, uh, and uh, that I answer each and every of my email, that I finish my um, uh, inbox on my OmniFocus and the, all the other things so that I can rest in peace. Uh, but the other... <laughs> <laughs> The other unexpected side effect is that this is actually great for innovation because I literally wake up a different person. <laughs> I don't have any legacy system to maintain, right? It's all, <laughs> it's all handled it last night. And so, so, so I, I'm free to, to roam the, the internet and innovate in a very different fashion and just live every day uh, in a very fresh way. So maybe you can consider this kind of self-regulation as well. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for the awesome Q&A session. Thanks. We made it. Um, thank you so much, Audrey. Uh, so I just wanted to close um, and let folks know a little bit about the GovZero network or V network that's been formed. Um, and there's a, f a bunch of us here in this room and other folks in other cities. And really, we're a collective of people that have really been inspired by the practices in Taiwan. And we are coming together to learn and to figure out how we can bring these practices to our own localities. And it's not so much about lifting them, but really thinking about like how do we shift these structures and the systems uh, of power that underlie them. 
So I want to um, also give some thanks to all the people and the organizations and collectives and uh, really bodies that made this possible. So for today's uh, open government reception and Audrey's chat and all this food, we have the American Assembly at Columbia University, Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, ThoughtWorks, uh, that has lent us some VR equipment over there where you can like try out some of the really neat uh, work that Taiwan is doing in mixed reality and VR. Uh, Civic Hall Personally Democracy Forum, Beta NYC, and Delicious Food by Weekday Herbivore. So this it, closing reception is part of a larger uh, two-day event where we got to actually learn about the practices uh, that are happening in Taiwan, the V-Taiwan consultation and the participation officers training. Uh, and the sponsors for that were Composites Collective, The Awesome Foundation, and Serapis. Space is really important. We need a place to come together and to share ideas, and I think that's also very clear in, in the talk that Audrey gave. And so I want to give a huge thanks to Prime Produce that has allowed us to be here for the last two days. And I also think that it's really important to have spaces that are also aligned and sharing values. So it's such a gift uh, to be in a space uh, that is, as Prime Produce says, a guild for social good, where we practice the craft of intentionally serving others through our work. And there's another space in New York City that's been incredibly instrumental. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit out of order, so I'm gonna skip it, to getting us here. Um, and that's Orbital, and Gary is here up front, which makes me super, super happy. Uh, and V Network hangs out there. Uh, we've been meeting on Fridays for the last few months to, to organize this, and now that this is done, we'll continue meeting to organize something else. Um, and in the spirit of learning from Taiwan and their radical transparency, we've been recording and live streaming, and our plan is to actually put together a video of the training for the last few days. And that would not be possible if it wasn't for the Internet Society and the work of Jolly over there. Um, and it also takes a lot of people to put this together. So I would just like to thank the volunteers that have come together for the last few days. If you're here, please stand up. Uh, Cordelia, Christina, Evan, David, Dan, Nathan, Patrick, and Kate. Thank you so much for all of your help. Um, and last but not least, the folks that I've gotten to uh, work with so closely over the last year, uh, and I hope we get to continue working together. So if you could please come up here. Darshana, uh, Liz, Devin, and Tina. Tina, are you still here? Yes, please. And so we want you to join our V network and to, if you're interested in what you've heard, if you've been inspired, uh, you can go to govzero.network and join us. Um, or also, we spend a lot of time in Slack. Uh, and if you go to join.govzero.today, you can join the GovZero Slack. Uh, when you join, you'll get dumped into the general channel, which is mostly in Mandarin. So search for the V network channel, and you might feel a little bit more at home. Um, <laughs> And the other way, which I kind of forgot to fail to mention at the beginning, is, um, you know, that's, that's one of our main hashtags, but a lot of this came together just by people sharing on the internet. Uh, and actually, Twitter really brought us all together, sharing our ideas and sharing our plans. So I think that also leads back to this idea of radical transparency and just share, um, and you'll find your networks out there. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and a huge thanks to Audrey and her team.
music will con there will be some type of music playing very shortly as well as a bar that will help us operate in the black so please come and uh, join us we have the space for more than an hour so uh, yes let the party continue also please eat all of the food thank you yes DJ